tonight on CBC Vancouver News. But we need to intensify our activities as we come into the cold and flu season. BC's plan for the COVID-19 pandemic heading into the fall and winter also. It's a lot of uncertainty and that causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of parents, especially me. Five, seven. Back to school, the big return sparks big worries and... Our neighborhood is suffering. Why housing affordability is no longer Vancouver's number one issue. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. Well, as summer fades and many people go back to some kind of routine, BC has revealed its plan for whatever comes next. The CBC's Briar Stewart looks at the province's strategy for dealing with flu season in the middle of a pandemic. With summer fading and many back to some kind of routine, BC announced its plan for whatever comes next when influenza season erupts in the middle of a pandemic. We are investing $1.6 billion into our health care system. This will mean 7,000 jobs for health care support workers in long-term care and assisted living facilities. Well, half of the money has already been allocated, more will be going towards staffing and training. The province wants to increase surge capacity, staffing an additional 2,500 hospital beds if needed. It wants to boost testing to 20,000 a day, including testing for the flu. It's also ordered an additional 450,000 doses of the influenza vaccine. We know that um, the symptoms of influenza and COVID, especially early on, can be very similar. The province insists it has enough capacity, but warns if needed, it will roll out more restrictions. <laughs> this was the scene last night on a subdued Granville Strip. All nightclubs were ordered closed, and last call for alcohol is now 10 p.m. We might have to switch to doubles. Some are skeptical what kind of an impact that will have. I was getting kicked out of here. I'd be grabbing a group of buddies and going back to my place. <laughs> for staff, the restrictions are a blow. Because you rely on, you know, people coming in, you rely on tips. The province is hoping some hospitality staff will be interested in filling one of the 7,000 new jobs for health care aides. The union representing many of those workers say new hires are desperately needed in long-term care homes, but that's not all. We are going to have to continue to be vigilant, though, to ensure that the workers on the front lines are supported, that we have enough of them, that we have them deployed in the right places. So the system is better prepared for a potential surge of cases in the coming months. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. And now for more on the province's fall and winter pandemic plan, our reporter Tina Lovegreen joins us in studio. And Tina, as we heard, they are ramping up testing, hiring more health care support workers and encouraging more of us to get the flu shot. That's right. There is a going to be a huge push for everyone to get their flu shot this year. The province has purchased its highest ever number of flu vaccines, ordering almost 2 million doses. Now that's nearly 450,000 more than previous years. And the thinking is, if everyone gets their flu shot, a few things will happen. Fewer people will get sick, so less of a burden on our health care system. And if fewer people will think they have COVID, therefore easing testing capacity know that um, the symptoms of influenza and COVID, especially early on, can be very similar. So we all want to stay healthy um, during this coming season, more so than ever, so that we're not having to go get tested, trying to figure out what it is. And we know as well that influenza causes severe illness in quite a lot of people, particularly our elders and seniors. Another new addition is the hospital at home model. It's for patients who need to be observed but can be cared for at home. They'll now be able to do that and will be able to be offered 24-7 care without taking up a bed at the hospital. And this will also reduce their chances of being exposed to COVID-19. Okay, Tina, the hospital at home model. Oh, sorry. Tina, we're going to go to a question for you now. So one thing we've seen in BC is that new cases tend to spike around holidays or traditional celebrations and Halloween just around the corner. So did we hear anything about that today? We sure did. Dr. Bonnie Henry was asked about that and she says, yes, you can totally celebrate Halloween, but like everything else that's going on in our lives right now, it's going to look different. We're working on some guidance that we'll put out around this. 
but I really think we need to think about small groups outside, not having somebody come into your house, but having maybe the neighborhood doing things at the end of the driveway, having prepackaged um, treats for kids so that they're not um, rummaging around in things. And, and you know, there's, there's lots of ways we can still celebrate, and I think it's important for us to still celebrate. So no Halloween parties, but you can still pick out your Halloween costume and plan a COVID-19 safe trick-or-treat. Dan, Mike? All right, well, many people have already got their masks, so that's good. Thanks, <laughs> Tina. Well, hospitalizations are on the rise as BC deals with the consequences of relaxed physical distancing measures and increased contact between groups. 37 people are now in hospital, 15 of them in intensive care. That is the most since the end of May. Fortunately, no new deaths to report today, so BC's total remains at 213. There are 100 new cases in our province today, though active cases have gone down for the first time in two weeks, albeit very slightly, to 1,378. There are new outbreaks at the Royal Arch Masonic Home in Vancouver and at the Milieu Children and Family Services Society in Surrey. 12 long-term care facilities and three acute care units of hospitals are dealing with outbreaks. If you tend to drive onto BC ferries, you soon won't be able to stay in your cars. Transport Canada is reversing one of its COVID-19 response measures on most routes. The agency was allowing passengers to maintain their own pandemic-proof bubble by remaining inside their cars during sailings. But on September 30th, Transport Canada is rescinding that temporary change. It says adequate measures are now in place to prevent COVID-19 transmission, and it just isn't safe for people to be in cars on enclosed decks. Premier Horgan, though, says this change from the federal government isn't what BC needs right now. Uh, we're, we're certainly going to continue to press the federal government. We have, uh, I think, the, the directive uh, takes effect September 30th. Uh, we are in the throes of, uh, you know, moving resources into public transit, uh, whether it be BC Transit, TransLink, and BC Ferries, uh, to, so we can stabilize our public transportation systems. This uh, is an unwelcome uh, intrusion by the federal government at this time, and we're going to pursue it aggressively. BC Ferries may also be anticipating pushback from the public. They also announced zero tolerance for abuse towards any of its employees. And many students head back to school tomorrow in our province. And while some may be learning from home, others inside classrooms, it's far from what anyone is used to. And as our Zara Premji reports tonight, there's at least one thing everyone is facing, uncertainty. Mommy! You want that? Okay. One more sleep until the big day, but it'll look a little different than before. I'm putting an extra mask. Seven-year-old Rafael Kazernia is starting at a new school in New Westminster on Thursday. It's already nerve-wracking. Now throw a pandemic into the mix for the almost grade two. It won't be the same for the little guy who's used to high-fiving his buddies. Um, I'm feeling um, a little scared because uh, I'm scared of sick children there. The family of two has kept their bubbles small since COVID-19 hit in March, but as a single parent, homeschooling just isn't an option. I know I'm going the opposite of what I've been implementing this whole time, but I also don't want him to miss out on whatever's happening in classrooms. Money M just wants smaller class sizes, more space, and days split into half-day sessions. How are they going to keep the students safe, um, or socially distanced if possible? Is that even possible in classrooms? So there's a lot of uncertainty, and that causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of parents, especially me. Teachers are fearing what's ahead as well. This classroom is not a picture from pre-COVID, no. It's what it'll look like for Chris Stoltz's high school students starting Thursday. In this classroom, uh, on tomorrow there will be 27 people, 28 including me. We will be, it will be impossible to socially distance all of us um, by more than one meter. Everybody in this room is going to be within one meter of another person. The teacher of 22 years says he's worried about this curveball, that he'll catch COVID or his students will. While masks are not mandatory, he's hoping his students will join him in wearing them. There you go. I hope I don't. As for seven-year-old Raphael, well, despite the pandemic and its uncertainties, he just wants to see his friends. I feel actually, um, great. So I'm going to school, not online classes. 
But his mom says that might have to change as she tries to balance his education with his safety. Zara Premji, CBC News, New Westminster. YVR is canceling part of its long-planned expansion as a result of the devastating effects of COVID-19 on the travel industry. Based on passenger demand, we simply do not need uh, that kind of a, a facility uh, in the foreseeable future. The expansion included a new utilities building, geothermal heating and cooling system and a new parkade. Now all work on the more than $500 million undertaking will stop by November. The airport authority is shifting their financial focus towards more immediate projects and pressing health and safety concerns instead. The plan was initially put into place when the airport was seeing double-digit growth. The Boeing jetliner involved in two deadly crashes is going through flight testing over the lower mainland this week, aimed at returning the plane to active service after it was grounded worldwide last year. The tests are being conducted out of YVR by the EU Aviation Safety Agency, which has judged the 737 MAX 8 ready for testing. The airport was chosen because of COVID-19 travel restrictions between Europe and the U.S. The plane has undergone a redesign since nearly 350 people died in two crashes in 2018 and 2019. Transport Canada and the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration both began testing the updated plane elsewhere this summer. A 60-year-old man has been charged with first-degree murder in connection to the 2017 death of Nanaimo teen Michaela Chang. Stephen Bacon was a person of interest early in the case. He was arrested in September in Fredericton on unrelated charges. 16-year-old Chang was reported missing in March of 2017. Her body was discovered later that spring. RCMP say the investigation that led to the charges involved help from everyday people and police agencies throughout the country. Chang's family say they are relieved to see the charges. I'm very pleased, very pleased. Um, it's been a long time coming. We've been waiting uh, quite an extended period of time now with this COVID thing and everything else. So I'm um, very happy about the news today. Bacon's first court appearance has not yet been scheduled. In Kelowna, RCMP are hoping to speak to witnesses who may have seen a police officer dragging a university student across the ground. Police are investigating the officer's conduct during a wellness check in January. Mounties are looking to speak to two men seen in the lobby of an apartment on Academy Way near the UBC Okanagan campus, January 20th at about 5.45 in the afternoon. Constable Lacey Browning is seen in surveillance video dragging student Mona Wang across the lobby and later stepping on her head. The first man who went up the stairs is described as having light hair, clean-shaven face. He was wearing a jacket, possibly green, and blue jeans. The second man who went left is described as having dark hair and facial hair. He was wearing a dark winter jacket with an orange-lined hood and a dark backpack. Anyone with information is asked to contact RCMP. Fires are burning all down the United States coast from Washington to California. The latest on the deadly and destructive fires and how smoke will affect us next. And thanks for staying with us online during our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, hydrogen has often been called the fuel of the future, but a renewed focus on alternative energy could soon make it the energy choice for today. And Canada is aiming to be at the forefront of the emerging sector. Kyle Bax has details on the federal plan to power up the industry. This is what you're going to connect to. David Lloyd shows how he fuels up his new Toyota with hydrogen. He bought the car a few weeks ago. For Lloyd, it's quick, quiet and exhaust free. All the reasons why he's enjoying the ride. Mostly I'm surprised that I could get in on this sort of next wave of technology. Powering cars is one thing, but hydrogen's true potential is in decarbonizing some industrial sectors like steelmaking, heating buildings and fueling trains and heavy haul trucks. The federal government is putting the final touches on a new national hydrogen strategy to kickstart the industry. The focus is on reducing emissions. Things are changing very quickly. This lockdown has been an accelerant on, on trends that we knew were happening. And hydrogen is one of those trends. So we want to get ahead of it. 
Part of the strategy will be financial incentives to help spur more innovation and try to rev up the sector. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. They say you can't always get what you want, but fans of the Rolling Stones can get some satisfaction if they happen to be in London today. I see what you were doing there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's because the British rock band has gone ahead with its launch of its first ever flagship store. And for the rest of us stuck on this side of the pond, here's a glimpse. So this is RS number no. 9 Carnaby, the world's first Rolling Stones flagship store here on the world famous Carnaby Street. Why would you open a shop during a pandemic? Well, you know, it's op eternal optimism. Uh, I mean, yeah, you could have put it off, I guess, till next year. But I mean, there'll be a little bit of pickup, I think, yeah, and people will be curious. To take a store like this to the marketplace, I think, is a really powerful and exciting message. You know, we used to work around there. We rehearsed near there. Used to eat near there. Uh, but I mean, it's but it's also now it's really good. Uh, place to have a, a, a shop in that corner is yeah, it's not bad. All of the product, whether it's about the design, whether it's about the, the, the base garment, whether it's about the really cool new RS number no. 9 logo at the back of the garment, all of those elements make it a unique product to the store. Got here at 6 o'clock, half past 4, got here at 6, got here at 11. Hopefully it, it, it'll, it'll be a nice place to hang out and go and, you know, be nearby and I don't know, hope you can get a cup of coffee in there or something. You know, it, I'm sure it'd be fun. Well, with that out front, there's no mistaking what's going on there. No, absolutely yeah. not. Are you are you a Stones fan? Would you be excited? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and it's already proving uh, very popular. Yeah, it seems cool. All right, back in just a couple of seconds with more news. Stay with us. The world is not back to normal. Life has not fully resumed. We are not at the finish line yet. We know we can do it. As phase three of the economic New restart. COVID restrictions will mean that element. In times like these, get trusted news from a trusted source, your public broadcaster. Anytime, anywhere, anyway. CBC and Cuba. The city of Vancouver is holding a special council meeting Friday to discuss alternative options for the growing tent encampment in Strathcona. It comes as a growing chorus argues the city's growing homeless population has led to more crime. Justin McElroy now on why for the first time in years it may have replaced housing affordability as the city's number one issue. Another day, another news conference where the government makes another announcement to help the homeless. We all know it's been a tough year here in Vancouver and that everyone is feeling stressed out. COVID forced hundreds of people in precarious housing out on the street. Strathcona is the city's third tent encampment in 2020. At the same time, people in neighborhoods nearby like Yaletown have complained crime is on the rise. For the first time in years, the price of housing doesn't seem to be the biggest hot button issue stirring angry debates. The conflict over streets and street cleanliness and street order and that kind of thing, it's, it's definitely top of mind for lots of Vancouverites. That's probably the single most issue that we hear about, uh, and for good reason, because certainly uh, we see a lot more garbage on the streets, we see a lot more human waste on the streets, we see a lot more needles, we see more violence. After months where politicians have prioritized the concerns of homeless campers, their focus now is on nearby residents. The children in this neighborhood are taught to identify needles that are discarded and, and how to deal with them. And likewise, they're taught how to deal with people who are, let's say, unfriendly to them. Jamie McLaren is a Strathcona lawyer, organizing a potential tax revolt if the city doesn't build enough social housing. He says people in Strathcona empathize with the most marginalized, but says the line of acceptable dangerous behavior has been crossed. When it becomes widespread and seemingly out of control, uh, then it becomes a real issue and it's, it's a legitimate concern, I think. In the midst of a housing and overdose crisis and global pandemic, how much of a concern it should be is a fair question. But it's enough of one for the mayor to take notice. 
I agree that, that there has been a change in, in public tone, uh, and it's our job as politicians to make sure that we move resources to where they're most needed. And that's, I think, how I'll be judged when the next election comes along, is how well did we tackle this. But he doesn't want expectations too high. Cities, it's never about ending anything. It's about managing it better. I, and I think when I talk to mayors around the world, like those kind of promises are, you know, they shouldn't be made. A far cry from the city's last mayor who promised and failed to end street homelessness, but an accurate measurement of where Vancouver's ambitions now lie. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Vancouver. A one-year-old boy was killed, his parents severely burned as they were fleeing wildfires in Washington state. Multiple fires are burning right across that state tonight, even leveling an entire small town in the eastern part of Washington state. This was my front room. There's my oven, my cast iron you know, wood burner and oven. Governor Jay Inslee says more acreage has burned in a 24-hour period than Washington usually sees in an entire fire season. High winds are contributing to the fire spread. They're also being blamed for downing power lines and leaving many people in the southwestern part of the state without power. And meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff now joins us with more. So Joe, you've been keeping an eye on these fires and just devastation down there. Absolutely. In fact, the situation across all three states has worsened over the past 24 hours. You were talking about uh, things in Washington state uh, getting worse. Uh, same story last night in Oregon. I have to show you pictures out of southern Oregon. The Almeida fire tore through several communities. In fact, six different communities have been substantially destroyed with fires last night that were uh, fanned by 75 kilometer per hour gusts, uh, including one town of about 7,000 people, Phoenix, Oregon. That's where 1,000 homes were destroyed. Many people having to drive through the flames to evacuate and officials really trying to get a handle, of a, handle on the situation uh, almost 20 hours later, still not sure who's missing from each of those uh, communities. Uh, those fires, 35 fires burning in Oregon, uh, moving through about 300,000 uh, acres last night and at least two people were killed. Uh, similarly, thousands evacuated in the middle of the night in Northern and Southern California when those uh, fires Fires uh, continue to be fanned by Santa Ana winds. I want to take you, though, to uh, what the governor of Oregon said today. It, it has been a dire situation, and it continues to be a tough situation for firefighters. Take a listen. We are all in the same soup of cataclysmic fire. And the reason we are in the same soup is because the grass is so dry, the temperature is so hot, the winds are so heavy. And these are conditions that are exacerbated by the changing climate that we are suffering. And I do not believe that we should surrender these subdivisions or these houses to climate change exacerbated fires. We should fight the cause of these fires. So that was the uh, governor of Washington uh, saying how all three states really are connected. And here in British Columbia, we are watching that situation closely under high fire risk in through the interior and watching for that smoke to return across the southern sections of the province for tomorrow. Let me show you the uh, forecast highs right across southern BC. This is where we have not one, not two, but three special weather statements in place. Two for air quality, one because of the smoke moving back in tomorrow, but also that high pressure really cooking the low level, low level ozone, so poor air quality regardless. And the third, temperatures. Take a look at that heat tomorrow, possibly getting up to 28 in Vancouver. We will see things cool down a little bit for Friday, but definitely a lot to watch for in the next 24 hours. Absolutely. All right. We've got your eye on it. Thank you so much, Joe. It's a mural meant to spread cheer and happiness. Meet the artist behind this Port Moody creation. That's coming up. I'm here at Simon Fraser University to do a story on computers. I wonder if my boss made the right decision to send me, whether or not he used the right process. 
The university has one that helps management make decisions about hiring, firing, and who should make coffee in the morning. Does the problem have a quality requirement such that one solution is likely to be more rational than another? Yes, no, or help? Yes. This one is called a decision Do support system. It can even be used in the television news business. The story assignment editor wants to know if it's worthwhile to do an item on, say, computers. He plugs in and is ready for action. I must have done something wrong. Is acceptance of the decision by subordinates critical to the story? It certainly should be. The computer lists a series of predetermined questions. The operator answers yes or no. The result is a printout from the machine that indicates whether or not to cover the story and how it should be done. If he's wrong, he can always blame the computer. I spelled my name wrong. <laughs> I gotta do it again. <laughs> Embarrassing, eh? It certainly is. <laughs> the next thing could be a machine that does the reporter's job. And now we're looking at the uh, final recommendations the, the computer makes, and uh, now all I have to do is go ahead and uh, and follow its suggestions or make a decision on my own. Okay. Writes, edits, and narrates. And never makes a mistake. And never makes a mistake. No, you're putting in your name. You're on the first question. Oh! And never makes a mistake. And never makes a mistake. As long as you kick it once in a while. I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Lee Ann Young for Vancouver Magazine's Restaurant Awards. Toast the city's top restaurants virtually this year on Zoom and Facebook. Register at vanmag.com. And don't miss Surrey Fusion Festival on September 26. Celebrate food, music, and culture virtually with cooking demos, dance lessons, and more. Visit surreyfusionfestival.ca for the full lineup and check us out at cbc.ca slash bc. Well, an international mural artist has returned home to Port Moody to add some color to her city. Ola Volo is almost done spray painting a mural on the side of the building of Rocky Point ice cream. And our cameras caught up with her to see what her inspiration is behind the piece. So the mural that we're painting in Port Moody is about 20 feet high and 90 feet across. And it's gonna take about the rest of the week. This mural in particular, it was a collaboration with Rocky Point Ice Cream and myself. And they reached out to me because they really wanted to see something like an, a narrative in, in an art piece. And so for, when we started to think about what we're going to put into this piece, we wanted it to reflect Port Moody and the animals that surround this area. You'll be able to see, uh, you know, mountains and boats and seals and bikers, everything in a mural where that reflects Port Moody. So when I got this offer, um, it, I, I knew that like, I wanted to paint something in my community for a long time, so it was just a perfect fit for having something that's super visible, something that's, that my family and friends go to a park all the time. And I really wanted to leave a mark in the place that I grew up in. I'm fortunate that when I produce these murals, it's, uh, it's the perfect <laughs> social distancing, as you can see, I'll be up in the air. Uh, by myself or with, a, with an assistant. So I've been trying to keep it busy by planning ahead. And I think, you know, I really, what really sparked my interest in the next, you know, in the next phase of my work is a lot more color, a lot more positivity. And I feel like it's our duty as artists to bring that to the streets. Usually with my work, you can kind of read the message really fast when you're driving your car. But with this piece, I think it's something where you can, you know, have a picnic enjoy the artwork and decipher it with your kids. What a cool piece. Yeah, it's looking good. Yeah. It gets to operate the genie lift and all, all that other stuff too. That's right. Great artwork there. <laughs> it is great. All right, just before we go, a uh, reminder, you can watch this newscast live online every weekday at 6 p.m. Yes, you can also find us on CBC Gem, Facebook, and on YouTube. And if you want to watch us on CBC television during the NHL conference finals, 
will be on at about 7.30, unless, of course, the game goes into overtime. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for watching tonight. Yes, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night. Good night.